begin by dedicating this sermon to Bruce McCubbin, my father-in-law, and thank him publicly for the idea for it. (laughs) If it doesn't work, you can blame him, by the way. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious God, sometimes we open the pages of Scripture and we uh, read unpleasant things. Today we deal with a passage about the murdering of innocent children. Lord, we ask you, and we invite you into the deepest, darkest recesses of our hearts today. Judge what is there. Remove what is not pure and holy in your sight and replace it with a right spirit. Lord, we thank you for being a community of support to each other. Help us to continue to be a community of support for the world. And Lord, I ask you then, to grace us with your presence, to judge the words of my mouth, that they might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So who we are is largely determined by our past. Our parents, or lack thereof, our previous experiences, our education, the people that we choose to emulate or idolize, all have an effect on who we are at present. Now, the information that we receive is unique to its source, but the interpretation of information, that's our affair. That's up to us. And this is a more hazardous thought than you might realize because it doesn't matter if the source material is true or not, it still has an effect. Even what we choose to reject has an effect on us. It solidifies what we believe to be true all the more. But what we accept and interpret forms the core of an identity, and it guides behavior. Now, one thing you need to learn about Scripture is that despite being written at different points throughout history, the authors of the various scrolls, books, and shards of pottery used to compile the holy book reference previous works in history. As the authors remembered things from their studies or their youth, the way we refer to the Bible makes it sound like one complete book, one unity, as if a single person had written it from cover to cover, from beginning to end, over a set period of time. But that's simply not true. Like a dossier, The Bible is a compilation of files many people have assembled over time to tell a story from a variety of perspectives. And we believe that God had a hand in assembling the dossier. The book that we hold, the book in front of you, that we adorn with leather and cloth, is the complete dossier. Now, Christians believe that the dossier contains the story of Jesus, the Messiah, Savior and Redeemer of the world. The dossier explains how Jesus came to be, what he did, and how he died, and also what comes next. But to explain it like that, with that sterility, robs it of the single most important reason this dossier was compiled. It explains why we should believe in him. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. First, let me ask you, how was your Christmas? You had a good one? Was it good? Anyone not have a good Christmas? Okay. I had a great Christmas morning. Um, (laughs) But as the day went on, um, my son's behavior began to change. Yeah, I'll try to explain, and maybe some of the parents here can give me some tips uh, after the service, because I don't know what happened. Um, Bruce and Pat, my in-laws, stayed overnight on Christmas Eve. Uh, Bonnie, my wife, and I had planned a kind of a loose agenda for Christmas Day. Uh, She bought the family matching pajamas for a picture that uh, we figured would end up on Facebook, but that really didn't come to pass. Um... Still, it was fun. First time I ever done something like that. 
Now, I got up after maybe five hours of sleep to help get Abe going for the day and uh, get breakfast started for the family. The plan was to have a nice breakfast and then go and open all the Christmas gifts. Obviously, Abe was going to be the recipient of a lot of the gifts, right? Most of them. We all thought he'd be overjoyed to rip into gift after gift. That did not happen. Um, Months ago, we were able to secure, as I was explaining to the kids, uh, a nice little kitchen playset for Abe. We didn't actually pay any money for it. A very nice young lady up the street donated it to this little boy. Uh, But it needed uh, accessories. So Abe got a lot of accessories. Sometimes uh, we go to the library in Rosedale or Woodlawn, as I mentioned to the kids. We go to this place called Storyville, and he likes to pretend to cook in the kitchen space. He'll spend a half hour doing it, picking up pots and pans, pretending like he's adding spices, all of that. Now, Abe, he loves his new kitchen. He loves it. It can be a little frustrating for him. He tries to open some doors. They don't open so easy, so he has to use two hands. Um, But he loves it. But the thing is, he couldn't be pulled away from it to open any other gifts. And every time we tried, he would register his discontent. I'll put it pleasantly, right? To put it very mildly. See, we had a plan, but he had another one. Yeah, laugh at it. It didn't matter how cool his other gifts were, and let me tell you, they were pretty cool. This was the gift that mattered. So it was a while before we could get the other gifts open. Now, I think he started getting tired of getting yanked this way and that, his attention being grabbed by this thing or that thing, and he eventually started having a series of meltdowns. Lunch did not go well. He barely ate anything, and it didn't help that he was getting over a cold either. I'm pretty sure I'm the one that got it. I took him to his room for his nap, and it took a a long time for him to settle down. He got up early from his nap, which is never a good thing. It usually helps his mood, but we could tell right away that mm, the opposite was the case. So I started fixing Christmas dinner. Now, I made several mistakes because Abe wanted us all together. He likes that. He wants to know everyone is together. And he didn't like that I was in the kitchen away from the group. So things began to unravel in the kitchen. And before I knew it, time got away from me. I needed to get food on the table or Abe was going to throw a temper tantrum because he gets hangry right around 5 p.m. Now, my wife and I rushed to get him a plate. We're doing everything we can to get him his food. And his nana sat down with him to eat while I finished up in the kitchen. So some things were either undercooked or overcooked. And I was getting frustrated. Abe ate a few tiny bites of food, but then he stopped eating again. This was all food that he liked. He didn't have a lot of experience maybe with the au gratin potatoes, so I didn't mind that he wouldn't try them, and they were probably the most underdone part of the meal, but he loves ham. Wouldn't eat it. Through temper tantrum after temper tantrum, when we offered him the food, He'd headbutt. He'd throw his food. He threw other things. He noticed the cookies and pie on a nearby cabinet, and he said he wanted some. We said, no, you got to eat your dinner first. Then you may have dessert. And that's when everything went to pot. He would not stop crying. He would not stop screaming. Finally, his exasperated mother dashed him to his playroom so we could have some peace. No one was peaceful at the table. We were all so frazzled, so we decided to end the night early. No one got any dessert. I felt bad because Albert McCubbin, the patriarch of the family and now over a hundred years old and still sharp as a tack, had to sit and endure this dumpster fire of a Christmas dinner. He was so kind and gracious. He gave me some words of encouragement and advice after the meal. And he thanked me. Well, normally that would make me feel real good, and it did when I was in his presence. But when I walked away, I had had it. As a Mexican man, for something like this to happen in the presence of someone so old, mm -mm -mm, couldn't take it. I finally exclaimed, isn't it amazing how one little boy can cause so much trouble? 
And that is when I remembered today's scripture, because Bruce pointed it out, and the events that it describes about how one innocent boy's birth, the act of being born, led to something horrible. Now, there's very little historical proof regarding what has been called the slaughter of the innocents, as described in the Gospel of Matthew. In fact, there's some dispute as to which Herodian king was in power at the time. That might help in telling us when all of this went down, so historians could look for it in the source documents of this atrocity of the state ordering the deaths of all the children in Bethlehem two years of age and under. But I'm not sure any of that actually matters. See, the dossier sitting in the pew in front of you, or perhaps maybe in your hands right now, is trying to show you why you should believe in Jesus. It was important to the author of Matthew that you know what happened at this point in the history of Jesus. It is up to us to interpret its usefulness. And what it says is that a king, who was really just a member of a wealthy family, supported by the religious establishment of the time, and put in power as a puppet ruler under the governor appointed by the Roman Empire, set out to murder a boy based on what the religious and historical literature of his people said. Now, the prophet Isaiah and other prophets produced literary works that seemed to describe the coming of a, a holy ruler, uh, that this formed a prophecy that was eventually accorded to Jesus by us Christians. Now, Herod, like all learned Judeans, he'd studied these writings. He might not have believed in them, but he'd studied them. And I think we all know what it's like to study the Bible but not really believe what it says, or to have a belief that seems biblical but not actually study the Bible. Now, the appearance of the Magi, studiers of signs in the stars as indicators of unique events on the earth, very important for things like farming, the growing of crops, but also um, sometimes venturing into the realm of astrology had suddenly brought these writings out of the realm of religious literature into something that was concrete in your face. And what Herod does in the story tells me that his study of religious literature didn't end up translating into a belief system. I mean, studying the scriptures was useful to him in the way that studying the Constitution of the United States is useful for understanding our country. But that doesn't mean you end up believing in it or becoming a, a patriot. In fact, you might have very different ideas about what it means to be a patriot or true American than what you read in the Constitution. Now, nearly a thousand years had passed since the prophet Isaiah had written about the divine ruler, the one they called a Messiah. We don't have a sense of what that even looks like in America, by the way a thousand years? What many consider to be Amer uh, modern American culture isn't even a hundred years old yet. Herod the Great was a brutal tyrant that suffered no opposition, even within his own family. He executed several of his sons, whom he suspected of plotting against his rule. The saying about him, there was a saying about him, usually attributed to Augustus Caesar was, it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. To someone like him, like that man, understanding the religious texts well enough was the key to ruling the people that believed in them, despite clearly not believing in them. He was known for his love of Roman style. He rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, much to the admiration of the religious folks, but he used Roman architectural ideas to do it, which some critiqued, but it was undeniably beautiful. They didn't care for his conduct in private and public affairs, but he sure could build a temple. 
So, when these men from other countries darken his doorstep with ideas from scripture that threaten his rule, he realizes that he's got some kind of potential rebellion on his hands. So he does what he does best. He breaks out the iron fist. And we get a story added to the dossier about how the birth of Jesus was both a blessing and a curse, a blessing to the suffering and a curse to the comfortable. Now, the epistle to the Hebrews, a letter for which we don't have an author, uh, but suppose that it was the Apostle Paul, writes the following in chapter 2. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through, through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. I think it's fair to say that when we uh, tend to believe someone we tend to believe someone more when we know that they've gone through what we're going through. More than someone who doesn't have the slightest clue, who clearly hasn't walked that road. I mean, in fact, we'll tell them that to their face. You don't have the slightest idea what I'm going through. We'll never know if Jesus was real in this life. We'll never know it. We can only have faith. And if we do, we know that he suffered even before he knew what suffering was. Babies don't have a concept of suffering. They scream and they cry because they don't have the words to express what they feel. They ruin holiday dinners because they don't feel heard. They rely entirely on us to help them make sense of the world, to learn to deal with it. And from the beginning, Jesus' world was hostile to him. Mary and Joseph walked a hard road. They were forced to uproot themselves to protect their family from a rich person with no morality. When he became older, Jesus undoubtedly heard this story about his family. Do you grieve in your heart for what he and his family had to endure? I do. And that is why I do what I do. Amen.